Good morning, Sean. Great to see you again. Good morning. Great to see you as well, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time, participating in our leadership series of uh, what's becoming a growing, growing interest in um, in these executive video interviews and uh, different topics that we're getting and so on. But yours is your area of expertise and 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 uh, the topic is um, is something a lot of people are interested in in right now. But to start off, could you just um, you know tell our audience who you are, what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a digital media executive. I run all of digital for Discovery Communications globally. Uh, my background has literally been in this space for almost 20 years, sitting at kind of the intersection of where consumer behavior has changed by digital media and where sort of content and products have come out and new businesses as a result, result of that. So I've worked everywhere from helping launch the original Disney web properties to HBO Go to building startups that in the ad tech uh, services space. Uh, to large kind of funded new media properties I've played in the kind of whole ecosystem. That's pretty exciting. Is that something you uh, you said, hey, when I grow up, I want to? Yeah, no, I, it, look, my background, oddly, as a child, um, at a very young uh, age, uh, two th amazing things happened to me simultaneously. I got my very first lead part in a play. So it's sort of that feeds almost the kind of stereotypical creative side that you'd expect. Right. You know, the ability to connect with audiences and understand sort of what they need delivered to them. And at the same time, I got my very first computer uh, and started writing in programming language. So that really enabled kind of the technology and interest in sort of building products and what technology was enabling. And that literally has been my career path since then. I've always sat in that kind of right brain, left brain mix of strategic and operational, mix of creative and technology to really help either start my own entities or start entities within companies who are trying to kind of crack what the consumer behavior changes of and how it's impacting their business, whether that's a marketing issue, a distribution issue, um, an audience issue. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, obviously, it relates um, to our main topic, and we'll get into some of the, the specifics related to you, but um, with all that said, how do you um, how do you define how do you define leadership? What's your perspective on what leadership really is? Yeah, for me, leadership really is about growing people, and it's really about helping them reach their goals and their full potential, no matter where that is. It's about a business environment, a social environment, your children, your peers. You know, it's the same way I like to be led by the leaders that I aspire to be. And my perspective is that everyone is a leader of some sort. And it's not necessarily there's a right way or a right type of leader. You could be the right type of leader for a certain situation. You could be the right type of leader for a certain culture. But building your leadership is an evolving skill. And the one that, frankly, you always need to work on if you want to improve. Because it's not really a static thing. You don't point to somebody and say, they're a perfect leader all the time, right? Patton may have been perfect for warfare, but he may not have been perfect for leading you know, a university. And so it's really sort of trying to figure out what the right leadership is for the right culture and at the right time. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Our uh, two favorite words in our business is right fit constantly. Right. And uh, I remember the uh, one professional football team, um, well, the Dolphins. I remember fans would complain one year the coach was too emotional and too involved and too everything, and then the next year the coach was not emotional enough and not involved in everything. It was so it's like right. you can't you that's can't right. win in that regard. Um, um, in, so it, with respect to that, digital media, you know, social media, the impact obviously on business has been has been huge. What's your experience on how it affects business owners, business leaders, um, decisions and actions for their business? Look, I'll sort of break that into two different areas. Digital in general um, is the constant question that I think any business you're in, when you sort of look at the competitive environment, what's happening in consumer behavior? What's happening with my competitors? What are they reacting to in the marketplace and what do I need to do for that? Digital is impacting people because it's it's highly connecting your consumers to ways to you in, in ways that you never expect to be that faster distribution, next day delivery, the ability to deliver messages on a daily basis for your consumers, even though you may be through traditional channels, all of a sudden to have direct relationships with you. It's really sort of an accelerated view that almost every way you do your business, from marketing to internal HR management to recruiting, have been impacted by sort of the speed that, and, and sort of accessibility that digital is bringing to your business. And so I, I think in terms of what I bring to the table when I talk to um, businesses that sort of look at themselves like, well, I'm a traditional business and I'm trying to figure out what digital is, is really, let, well, let's have a conversation. What you're talking about is strategically, what's your sort of five, ten year plan? What is the consumer behavior changing as being enabled by digital innovation? And what does that mean to you? 
And sometimes that can be highly threatening, like your distribution mechanism, which used to be geographically controlled, is literally being disintermediated, and how are you going to react to that? You know, newspapers are kind of dealing with those sort of issues. Or it can be more, to your point, uh, the second thing is more social, right, which is having a pretty impact, big impact on businesses because you have a lot of businesses who historically may have really, you know, had to care about their customers but never directly. Right? So if you're a packaged goods business, you pay a lot of attention and research to what are your consumers doing. But at the end of the day, your revenues are being more directly driven by your distribution channels. Like, what is Kroger doing for me? What is Target doing for me? And so all of a sudden you get into an interesting mechanism where you move from a world where, say, customer contact may have been research driven to literally the consumers expect, particularly millennials and sub-millennials, to actually have an active, authentic voice and communication directly with you. And that can be pretty threatening and, and concerning to some sorts of businesses because a lot of businesses and sometimes traditional media, for example, or traditional advertising is that way, have historically had a bit of a wall between them and consumers. And so you sort of have two options, I often argue. You can lean into this sea change where, where there aren't a lot of answers and say, this is a new time for me to have direct relationships, to be very authentic, to be okay being vulnerable as a brand with my consumers and figure out how to put that into my business mechanisms. Or you can take out, as some other uh, companies are, a little bit more of a passive approach, say, let's see how this sort of settles out. I'm comfortable being a second mover. I have a tendency to encourage people, and I use this analogy from experience I had on, on a travel, that as scary as it may seem, it's just scary because you've never done it. Mm -hmm. That there are businesses that make billions of dollars that have tens of thousands of customer touch points a day and they have figured out how to indoctrinate that into their thing and social sort of is that right like if you're a movie company people have been standing in lines talking about your movie and whether they like it or not for hundreds of years right since the dawn since the Lumiere brothers did it back in the early uh, <laughs> the beginning of the century just now it's actually public and so you can either ignore it or you can say let's participate in that And so I usually encourage that perspective um, particularly because, again, the coming generations have an expectation. You see it when you see some of the blowback you'll fall on, find on Twitter or Facebook when brands stumble. It's the brands that have been present and admit they stumbled, they survive. The brands who try and pretend that it's the old PR days where you can manage the message, that they suffer. Uh, and so I think it, it doesn't do the best to kind of lean away from it. It's interesting. It seems like it's a lot less painful not doing that suffering, as you said, and just being out there, kind of like, you know, always, uh, if you always tell the truth, you don't have to worry about what you told everybody um, type of deal. And, you know, words that I hear a lot from leaders that, that come into what you just said are, are authentic, transparent, and I'm, I'm not a big keyword guy, but this type of thing, and um, listening and pivoting. Uh, and what you're talking about is, you know, listening to, to how, it, how is a better way, how is a new way of doing it, and then pivot towards it. So it's, it's, it's fascinating what you, what you talk about. And, uh, you know, a lot of leaders talk about it, and then there's some others, obviously, that are, that are doing it. Um, let me ask you a question on that. Um, up-and-coming leaders, up-and-coming, you know, 20s, 30s people that are up-and-coming, and, coming, and they're, they're into tech to a great degree. How would you advise them to prepare for their careers in business to succeed in this digital media world, which they're probably obviously more in than, let's say, somebody more seasoned, yeah. but but it is, you know, it, it might not be accepted right away. They might have opinions that are right on the money, but no one's listening to them. How do you right. advise them to prepare for a successful career? Uh, look, uh, I tell them the great thing about digital is you just shouldn't be intimidated because it is still like inning one of, of sort of what it's doing to industries. And so don't be intimidated because the truth is most people are sort of early, in even those of us who have been sort of in it for 15 years have everything in our sort of knowledge cycle turns over in like three to five years. Right. And so in a world that's moving that fast, uh, just jump in because odds are you're either going to be in the cycle of evolution, right? It, it, it's like we had this discussion just earlier this week. There was a time if you looked at digital when kind of the portals, the Yahoo's and the MSN and the Excite at Homes were coming up and you thought, oh my God, the world is going to be controlled by these people. But we've gone through three iterations so far subsequent to that time with new players coming out. And, and, and understanding that the, the industry as a whole, I would say, is very accepting of new information because we all know we're like, uh, I don't know. I, as I tell people sometimes when we talk about some of the business areas that we work in, one of the quotes that uh, my team hears me say a lot, the one thing I can tell you I know about this area is that I don't know. 
right? right? <laughs> and when you when so the opportunity for uh, people to get into that is that also the amount of information that's available because it is digital is like infinite, and so the gap to at least get dangerous, you know, become like a six out of a scale of one to ten is actually doable completely on your own. And the ability to sort of round yourself out in the disciplines, which digital really requires multiple disciplines, like, hey, I want to learn a little bit about coding. I want to learn a little bit about SEO. I want to learn a little bit about design. I want to learn a little about product. I want to understand, you know, social marketing. All accessible information, whether you go to Code Academy, whether you get into a, a networking thing. And so because of that, it's much it can be more intimidating because the level of access you get versus say like if I decided I'd really like to get into mining which has basically been the same for you know decades mm -hmm. uh, I probably need to go move to West Virginia meet some miners it's like a very different experience versus if you're like I'd like to learn about you know how to run a social network you can do it from your desk and, and uh, there's a lot of people who will like reach out and help you Although I will tell you, I recently have been talking to a lot of Australians and they've been talking mining to me like crazy because they sell it to China. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear about that point. Not, not a bad place to be a, a high resource intense continent uh, near a uh, resource needy uh, economy. Yeah, Doesn't... Pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, hey, you've worked in, in startups, large organizations. Two, two points on that. What's the, what have you seen have been the advantages and benefits to working yeah. in each, but also with respect to Again, preparing to be on, on boards, there's obviously different type of leaders that are appropriate for the boards of a startup to, to a larger organization. So what's your overall thoughts on all that? Look, I, you're right. I, I've been really lucky to be have been in both, right? It sort of is the continuation of my left brain, right brain. It's sort of the, <laughs> I, I enjoy sort of being able to say, I've seen it, I've been in both, I've succeeded in both, I've failed in both, uh, you know, I sort of understand how they work. Look, at the end of the day, I would argue that there isn't much of a difference when innovating new ideas, new products, and new companies between a start, like the process of like, I believe there's an opportunity, validate the feasibility, see, you know, find a product market fit. The sort of overarching thesis of what you have to accomplish is the same. What is different is sort of, is generally sort of culture and speed issues. At a startup, there is no lack of focus and alignment, right? You have, I'm running out of capital, there's a small group of you, it's easy to manage a culture when there's somewhere between, you know, five to 25 of you, um, and you can move much faster and much more iterative. Right. On the kind of entrepreneur side of it, often it can be much more about managing the culture as an, not only you have to do the first thing, but you have to add the culture thing. So I've often argued that it's, it's harder, but it's easier on the outside than it is on the inside often. Because the company, you're often the innovator's dilemma problem inside the company. So if you have CEO sponsorship, that's better. But it can be a little bit more challenging. And I often, I, I find one of the myths of doing entrepreneurial work versus, uh, versus external work is there's this perception that because you're assigned with some large entity that they're just handing you gobs of money and you can go forever and there's no, there's no resource constraint. And I often laugh because a lot of those experiences for me have had far less funding than when I've been on the outside. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, because what you, work, what you worry about on the outside is, you know, external factors, you know, speed to market, all those kind of issues. But when you're doing an internal thing, you worry about all those same issues and then, by the way, internal corporate politics and, you know, the planning cycle and all the other things you sort of have to fit into. Right. It, can be, it can be a little bit more daunting. Um, but at the end of the day, the key thing is about having the DNA that is curious, wants to know where consumers are going, and how do you f turn that into a business. If you sort of have that inherent, which is sort of what my DNA is, well, why are we doing that and why can't we do X? then I, I think you'll work in both environments pretty well. Yeah, as we've talked uh, on the boards a bit, um, we're seeing, we're educating and we're seeing a lot more management and, and board people welcoming in, you know, younger, tech savvy, digital media, um, you know, type of people to, to, uh, to address, you know, not only what's going on now, but also what's going to happen two years, five years, ten years down the road, like you alluded to before. Are you finding that on boards? Uh, that you've dealt with or been on or, or, or you know been exposed to? I have, you know, look, uh, um, my exposure to the boards, you know, at large companies has been they're generally uh, they're pretty forward thinking. They they get they get concerned about that kind of stuff. I, I've often found in terms of uh, you know larger corporations, board buy-in 
generally speaking, in the majority of the time, is pretty savvy and forward thinking. They want to do the right things. They want to do the right thing. Some point, and have the self awareness that sort of you know that success can come from anywhere. And I've always found that great. I think you know in a pure startup boards, it is much more tactical and much. that might have $5 million of investment, right? They might look at it on a balance sheet. But if you're sitting on the board of that external thing, that $5 million is the entire company. Right. And so a lot of your conversations get into much more tactical experience that you can bring to them, like who are our distribution partners, what are marketing research you could help me, what is product and technology, either talent you can bring to the table. At the kind of more public and larger entity boards, um, I think it would be interesting for them as an exercise to have to go through a little bit of that, like to... If I could say one thing to expose larger boards to the digital evolution would be they should also sit on the board of one of the investments that they've done so they can literally see sort of the weeds. I think that would give them a new perspective that you're just not going to get when you're trying to manage, obviously, the fiduciary responsibility of a large public or a large um, enterprise. Yeah, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. Um, with all this background, you know, we all generally have had either mentors, influencers, or whatnot. Can you name one influencer that... Um, has had an impact on your career and maybe even your life? They've taught me my insatiable curiosity and the combination of my mom and dad is that strategic and operational part of my brain. They are those two people and I am the hybrid of them. I think on, in terms of my work, once sort of I got sent into the world by my parents, it's been the great mentors and I've been very lucky to start and end with them. You know, from Frank Sinton at Disney who gave me my very first big break, looked at me, this young kid who kept writing these kind of Jerry Maguire-esque decks about things he thought this company <laughs> should do and said, I'm going to give that guy a break because he's driving me crazy, uh, to J.B. Pret, who's my, you know, my latest leader here at um, it gave me my opportunity to step up here and run the digital team. So, you know, I've been very blessed to sort of had that kind of a great upbringing and then a great kind of uh, leadership experiences within my thing to kind of set a lot of my views. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, but now, now we're into kind of the one to two word answer type of questions, get a little to know you a little bit. But do you have a leader you most have admired, past or present, that you'd quote unquote love to have dinner with? Yeah, um, I love Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix. I think. Uh, not only is he sort of dis disintermediated a business, but he's had some pretty public hiccups that he's been able to recover and sort of to the authenticity point own. Right. Uh, and I love the fact that he's really, you know, to what drives me, brought together sort of the consumer trends and the technology and data to kind of take things to another level. It really kind of speaks to my id. Uh, and then another one, uh, Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of LinkedIn. We actually started our careers together. He's a friend of mine, but he's he's someone who's multivariate, multi hyphen great operational understanding, can be very understanding of the culture that needs to get done, very visionary, and just a, just an all-around great guy. I'd say those are pretty good choices. Um, <laughs> so um, these are truly one-word answers now. Um, do you have a favorite sport? College football. Go Trojans. All right. Um, how about favorite movie or TV show? Uh, my favorite TV show I just finished was Orange is the New Black, second season. Really enjoyed that. Uh, favorite movie uh, out of all the blockbusters this summer was How to Train Your Dragon 2. Because not only is it a great film, it's a really good one to share with your kids. got some good kind of storytelling. In. I love that. Well, since you mentioned kids real quick, um, I know you've got a couple of favorite words that your kids have taught you. Can you share those? Um, yeah, my son really likes large words. So... Um, uh, we've been singing a Sesame Street song that turned the alphabet into one word, which is Absodeftajikamonok Christuvixes. Uh, that came from Big Bird. And then my son's favorite word, which is the longest word ever in print, as he tells me, is Numano ultra, ultra Microscopic Silico Volcano Coniosis. And he nice. can spell it, which makes me laugh even more. And to think I'm still stuck on supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> nice job, well, that was, man. I, that's the word I whipped out. He was like, no, I got a longer one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a. Um, Favorite music? Uh, you know, I actually uh, love all types of music. My wife is on a huge country kick right now. Um, and my son and I, oddly, have gotten into classical um, because we've been reading a productivity study of that's the best to kind of do homework to. So we've been testing a lot of different uh, classical uh, together. 
I, I, I used to find classical great for homework, actually. Um, how about favorite type of food? Indian food, bar none. You could eat it all day long. Check out the movie A Hundred A Hundred Feet Journey. Oh, it's good. It was awesome. I'd love to see it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, hey, listen, thank you so much for the time. It's uh, it's actually been fantastic and fascinating. Really appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Mark.